setting a certificate in business stewardship. Her paper is entitled How to Engage Faculty in Digital Institutional Repositories and Open Access Publishing. She is the Electronic Resources and Digital Assets Librarian at Beagley and has worked in library technology since 2004. So her name will come up and her paper will showcase findings from an independent study on OA publishing and specifically on how to successfully work an institutional repository program within an academic community. Is this your cell phone? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just get my slides up. Not that they're Okay, so um, I'm the Electronic Resources and Digital Assets Librarian here at Beatley, and one of the things that I've been working on throughout the year is um, open access. Uh, I'm learning a little bit more about open access myself because I knew shockingly little before I started investigating it. And I was doing my research alongside doing my actual job here at Simmons. So I really want to point out that a lot of this research I did partnered with my actual job. And this is something that I'd really encourage everybody to continue as you go out into the field and become professionals to really partner and be as efficient as you can in terms of your research interests and what you're actually doing in your actual job so that they're actually meshing together really nicely and it's efficient. Um, one of the major questions we have here and uh, at small liberal arts colleges are, DIRs are fun and cool, right? Digital institutional repositories are fun and cool, but often there's a lack of faculty engagement. They just do not care, or we think they don't care. Um, so that was my main research question that I sent, you know, set out to answer. Um, and I found a lot of good stuff. Um, for the sake of time, I didn't write down any um, resources or I didn't cite anything specifically. Actually, my slides are very bare. I'm gonna talk a lot. Um, but if you have any questions about where this information came from, it is all documented and you can talk to me about it. I'm very happy to do that. My door is always open to students and faculty and pretty much everybody is glass is see-through. So. Um, so you can talk to me, but there's also more information in general about the open access movement and open access publishing through the library's um, LibGuide on open access publishing, which is just libguides.simmons.edu slash open access, all one word. Okay, so if you have any questions, um, I guess save them to the end. I don't understand how this is. Yes, mm -hmm. save them till the end. Okay. All right. So first I'm gonna give a little bit of background. Um, about where digital institutional repositories come from. They really come from the field of open access. Um, and that started within the computer science community and a way to produce code and communicate across networks in a consistent manner. So everybody was on the same page and developing things together. Um, and from there, it goes to um, open access publishing in scholarly journals. And that can be, are people familiar with gold open access and green open access? I see some people nodding, that's exciting. Um, I had no idea what those meant before I started researching this. Um, so gold open access really relates to material that's published in um, journals where the um, author puts forward the money in the publication. Um, and that money can come from the school, it can come from the grant, or the researcher's budget themselves. Um, and they put money up front, they give it to the publisher, they retain some rights, which is really important um, when we talk about open access. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end when we talk about engaging with faculty. Um, 
So you write, you maintain certain rights um, when you're writing your license to publish in a specific journal. And then your journal is open to everybody. They don't have to go through a paywall. You don't have to pay $10. You don't have to pay $25. It's open. Um, green open access on the other side of the coin is where you retain the right to deposit your published works in an institutional repository. And this can be at the institution level. I've also seen models where it's at the consortia level. <coughs> so digital institutional repositories have the added bonus. So you get a lot of access going on, which is why open access is great. It's got the name, you know, it's got access in the word. That's super great. But Digital institutional repositories also give libraries and institution the opportunity to preserve, oh my gosh, there's the other word, uh, um, faculty work, which is often not being self-archived. They don't even know what that means. You know, it's like, oh, you mean I have to organize my things in a consistent manner over the course of a decade? Uh, but I moved computers. You know, it's like, well, what happened to that preprint, print, you know, publication or postprint or where's all your data? Those are all really good questions that freak faculty out. So, um, it's nice because we can di digital institutional repositories can do that for them. They just don't know it. Um, <clears throat> so, digital institutional repositories. The main goal, although you can certainly put things behind a firewall, the main goal is to make research happening at the institution open to the greater community, whatever that community may be. So within your digital institutional repository, it's really important to diversify what you have going on in there. So, you can have images, you can have um, just journal articles, you can have di um, dissertations and theses, capstones are a really big deal. You really want to kind of integrate into the campus kind of like a cephalopod. You want to have tentacles all over the place because that makes it sustainable, meaning that you, they can't cut your budget because it will affect too many things. Um, and again, this is, you know, after researching this probably for about nine months, you start to pick up the tricks of the trade and what other libraries have done. It's like, oh, you don't want to fund us? That's fine. But the provost pet project of this research area is all living here. So if you want to cut it, go talk to the provost about them losing access to their exhibit on media, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's really important. You can also do um, conference proceedings through certain DIRs, um, and I've seen that grow more and more. Um, and I've t it's funny because I've talked to conferences here at Simmons, just in general about, what do you think about a DIR, or what do you think about a system that could do all of these things for you? They think it's pretty much fantastic because they don't have something like that right now. Um, we also, Simmons also has a shocking number of journals that are being published out of the school themselves. It's something like five to seven journals that are being published on campus in various formats from different schools. Um, and they're kind of all over the place. I actually bumped into them first when somebody called the reference desk and I, have to, I happened to be on a shift and they said, Simmons publishes this journal in social work. How do I get to it? Simmons is publishing journals? What? Uh, the School of Social Work is publishing their own journal? How do I find this? It took me five solid minutes, and I'm the electronic journals librarian to find this sucker. So um, giving them all a platform that's in one place 
is real can be really helpful. Um, DIRs also have sometimes they have um, built in publication workflows, so it can be easier for them. Again, building constituencies across campus so that you know should there come a time when the the project looks like it might not be funded next year, we can say, okay, fine, but all of the journals being published on campus are using this and they've put in a lot of time. You're gonna also have to tell them that this is being canceled. So it's all about building bridges and getting as many people into the system on board as, populate, as possible, populate it, populate it, populate it. So now that we've talked a little bit about what DIRs are and what you can put in them, which is almost anything, we're going to talk about keys to success. And that's kind of cheeky, I'm sorry. But, um, and the keys to success, and this is where a lot of the research that I've done in terms of interviewing other professionals in the field um, really comes into play. So. Program development, super nerdy, super crucial. A lot of people assume that when you buy a product like Digital Commons or DSpace or Islandora, which are all software options for your DIR, they think that that's the end. It's like, oh, we have a DIR because we are hosting an Islandora instance. That is not true. <laughs> the most crucial thing you can do is to build a collection development policy. And I know that sounds really obvious, but it's not. Um, the programs that really at the beginning said, this is what we're gonna take in, this is how we're going to take in the material, this is what it's going to look like, these are, you know, this is how everything happens and this is why we're saying no to you, if you want to say no to. I think the, one, the thing that was highlighted the most are things that are really not scholarly works, so book reviews, things like that. Those were kind of being rejected um, quite frequently by digital institutional repositories. So you want to have a program, you want to develop that program, and that comes along with staff development. So your staff really need to know about open access policies. They need to know about the history. They also need to know about copyright. Um, our good friends at Harvard have a squad called Copyright First Responders, and they basically train librarians, but also core constituents from each department. So it could be a faculty head. It could be a new faculty that wants to bolster their involvement in the institute. Um, but it's a really great way to educate staff about open access and copyright across the campus because that comes up a lot when you're talking about my rights as a publisher. I have no idea what those are. Who can I ask and talk to about it? Well, you can ask a librarian, which is not super likely actually, or you can talk to Jim because you saw him at the staff meeting last week and he seemed to know what he was talking about. Internal staff training opportunities can also come from MOOCs, ALA trainings, um, webinars, books. Um, the library itself, we set up our own learning community on campus. So they, we had a few internal staff members in the library that we all came together and said, we're really interested in open access and learning how that is related to copyright. Um, so we met pretty much for nine weeks and we really just, learned together as a group about these, the history, the policies, um, what it looks like, and we kind of waded through things together and asked each other challenging questions, et cetera, shared articles we had read, et cetera. Um, so that's free. You can do a learning community anywhere. Um, you can also, the other thing that makes your program a success is to it integrate it into the core services that your library is offering. So that means it's in your mission statement and it cuts across all staff members, which makes it 
again, really hard to disentangle if they try to take it away from you. <laughs> it's all about sustainability. Um, and realigning the services of the library for the future. So along with training your library staff and making this a part of the library core services, you really need to think about the roles that the librarians are playing and the workflows that they're doing. And you should really build off of those in an efficient way. So for example, I could do a lot of the rights management because I do a lot of licensing and rights management already. But I don't really talk to faculty. I mean, I could, but I really don't want to. But Jeremy is super good at talking to faculty, right? He likes doing that and is paid to do that already. So as an outreach person, Jeremy is a really obvious choice where I'm, I mean, I could do it. But I don't really have time because we're integrating these things across the staff level. You really want to find a system that, again, is sustainable and offers the least amount of risk. Whatever that risk is for you, if it's money, server space, buy-in, etc., you really want to choose a system, and again, that's the software, not the program, that works for you. So take the time and evaluate Talk to other people, see what's working for them. Find other libraries the same size as you and talk to them, which is exactly what we did. We also saw that successful programs didn't call it a DIR, they called it something else because nobody knows what that means. So stop using jargon. Um, we're not good at that. <laughs> um, so, if you name it something, so for example, a geographical feature on campus is really common, um, or you could name it something to do with the school mascot, I've seen that a lot, um, or something that's a, a, a part of a core value of your institution. Um, something that doesn't say DIR, and something that doesn't say library. Um, those are generally the ones that work out best. Um, and then you get into the workflow. So the workflows that we've seen to be the most successful are things that do not involve faculty. And I'll say that again. They don't involve faculty. You don't have to wait for faculty to send you their pre-publication because they never will. Unless they're mandated. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit too. So, the system that I've seen that I think works the best is you basically start out and you pick a department. You pick a department or you pick a faculty member that's tenured or somebody who's new. And then if you can get their CV and the list of publications that they have, that's fantastic. If you can't, that's fine, because you are going to do an author search on them in Web of Science or Scopus already. So once you have built your list of publications for that faculty member, you're going to look at all the journals that they published in, and then you're going to compare that with the rights that you see in Sherpa slash Romeo. And if you don't know what that means, I can talk to you about that afterwards. I see some faces going like, what is that? Um, so you do the rights checking for them. What you can publish, what you can deposit in the green open access repository, you do. You don't tell them, you don't talk to them about it. The first time that they necessarily know about this is when I start sending them statistics on how many people are looking at this stuff. How many people have seen it in the repository and they say, what is this? What do you mean people are looking at my research? This is fantastic. How do I do more of this? And that's kind of the hook. Then I've, I've heard stories of like departments getting like hyper competitive, which seems awkward like internal department wise, but the libraries love it, right? Because then all of a sudden you've got people's CVs pouring in and you know, it's, Institutions of this size, you often don't have people that have published like 50 things, right? You can do a department in a relatively short amount of time, like a semester. 
which is really helpful. Um, and again, those statistics show use. And again, that is good for the faculty member, but it's also really good for the system. It's good for the library. It's showing that, hey, this sucker is getting used, which is really great. And this is my last slide, faculty study, faculty buy-in, right? So I would recommend that you go after faculty who are tenure or are brand new. The people who are in the heart of their tenure process do not have time for you and you're an annoying bug that's bothering them. Don't do it. You'll make enemies. So with new faculty, get them in early. Make open access training, make copyright training a part of their onboarding process to the library and to the school. And that can be in the library or not. It doesn't really matter. Alt metrics is another thing that's being, it, it's on the horizon. There are a couple of products right now. Alt metrics and plum print, what is that? Plum analytics. Um, and those are basically showing that there are other metrics than just citation metrics to show what's going on with your research. So that's something that's developing and we should all be keeping an eye out on them. I'm seeing mostly librarians, yeah? So it's, if you don't, if you've never heard of the term alt metrics, in five years, it's gonna be a really big deal. So pay attention to it now. Spark is another great resource that you can send to faculty. And often the number one question we get is, well, if I put something open and it's out there, do people actually find it and use it? Are my citation numbers gonna increase? And actually Spark has put together an entire website of all the studies that have been done to answer that question. And I think it's something like 70, 70 studies have shown that if you deposit in open access, your citations increase, um, and only 20 show neutral. So, I mean, it's like neutral or super good. I would do it if I was a faculty member. And then rewarding people. So partnering with the provost's office, partnering with campus um, departments. Um, so what, what, what do we have here? We have special programs. I think that's the name of the department here. Um, those are the people who handle all the grants. You know, so partnering with them and really highlighting and applauding people for depositing, giving awards so that they can put that on their CV. People love that stuff. And it doesn't cost any money to give somebody an award. It's super easy. And then you can offer them services. Once they're involved and they're interested, you can offer other services through the library, such as copyright, you can, um, copyright training, open access training. You can um, even train them on how to do contract addendums to their publication, um, to their a publication license, which is actually really hard. Researchers don't know how to do that. They don't want to do that. So if we could do that for them, they would love it. Um, fair use training, where to publish in journals, journal recommendations, that's all, they would love that. All of this is basically to show faculty, look, this isn't gonna waste your time. We're not asking you to do anything extra. We're actually providing you additional services and programming to help you. So we're not that fly that's gonna bother you. We're only helping you. And if you want more help, you can continue to come to us. And the last thing you can do is really advocate for policies on campus. Um, but from, what it, from again, what I've seen is open access policies that are mandates at the college are really only successful if they're faculty driven. And you can have a librarian scream into the night all day long, um, but faculty hold the power and until they pass it in the faculty senate themselves, um, again, the library is happy to be a resource um, but unless the faculty decide to do it themselves and champion this on campus, it's not gonna happen. So don't waste your time there, but, um, but you can be a resource to them. Yeah, I think that's it. Does anyone have any questions? We're gonna do questions at the end. Oh, we're gonna do questions at the very end. Oh. I apologize.
Next up, we have Lily Troya. She is an archives master's candidate here, and she's also the Dean's Communications and Social Media Fellow. Um, she serves on the Acquisitions and Appraisal section of SAA as social media intern. She's the NEA's Education Committee, uh, sorry, she's on the NEA's Education Committee as a student representative and was awarded a summer fellowship at Rutgers Institute of Jazz Studies Archives. Um, she will be presenting a presentation entitled Rights and Productions Policies in the Open Access Age to continue with our theme here. And she will explore the parameters of current copyright, copyright law as it pertains to reproductions, potential revenue loss faced by institutions eliminating or reducing licensing fees and the historical notions of custodial control over cultural. I'm a Mac user, sorry. <laughs> I have like a play slideshow button that just doesn't go. Um, I don't know that I really need this, but I'll use it anyhow. Um, so, in 1884, New York portraitist Napoleon Cerrone sued the Burroughs Giles Lithographic Company for selling reproductions of his well known photograph, Oscar Wilde number 18, which might look very familiar to you. Uh, while Congress had actually extended copyright protection to include photographs nearly 20 years earlier in 1865, the newness of the technology kept the public opinion really suspicious about what level of creative energy was involved in photography. However, Cerrone was widely known not as a photographer but as a positioner. Um, he took great care at arranging the scenes. He's quite famous for this couch that Oscar Wilde was seated at. Um, and in the end, he actually had an assistant operate the camera itself. He was literally just setting the scene. Uh, the court ruled in his favor and opined that we entertain no doubt that the Constitution is broad enough to cover an act authorizing copyrighted photographs so far as they are representatives of original intellectual conceptions of the author. The defendant's argument had been that the photographs are not writings or creations of an author. Uh, but in the um, ruling opinion, George um, Justice Cotton said, in my opinion, author involves originating, making, producing, um, uh, which, let's see, originating, making, or producing, whether it be a drawing, painting, or photograph. So the Cerrone decision really helped solidify um, photography's legitimacy as a potential artistic exploit. And as cultural perceptions of technology began to change, it paved the way for a copyright policy that would keep expanding to involve and include new technologies. In addition, the case also helped solidify the central precept of the originality standard um, and what criteria must be met for something to be copyrightable. Um, in the US, courts have generally interpreted the standard to support a higher threshold for what constitutes originality than their European counterparts while simultaneously offering stronger protections um, to that which copyright is granted. While the guiding principles governing the US versus UK copyright are fairly parallel, UK policy is tended towards a more inclusive definition of originality, with the artistic threshold being very low and requiring only a small amount of effort exerted for a work to be eligible for protection. This is called a skill and labor standard, and it doesn't entirely coalesce with a US approach to copyright, which isn't as interested in the contributing effort as much as its uniqueness. In contrast, a skill and labor standard focuses on the act of creation rather than the court's determination of originality. Comparison of the two models reveals some incongruences. Uh, the US approach to copyright law is intended to encourage development of creative works for the public good whereas elements of the UK paradigm reward the effort of creation and are aimed more at protecting the creator. These variant approaches have manifested in other policy realms. Uh, for example, in 1997, uh, you'll see my bottom bullet here, uh, the EU passed a sui generis right, which extends copyright to databases. Um, and this is not regarding their content, just their structure. This law has no requirement of creativity or originality, and instead it just emphasizes the labor invested in developing the database. In contrast, contemporary US policy is really pivoted around FICE Publications Incorporated versus the Rural Telephone Service Company. In this case from 1991, the Supreme Court ruled that Rural Telephone Company could not copyright the information published in their phone book, and that despite the sweat and brow required to compile the database, Sheer collection and organization of information does not comprise of the creative spark that's really pivotal to the US um, version of copyright and the originality standard. 
So notions of originality might seem far and removed when we're considering permissions policies regarding rights and reproductions employed by cultural heritage institutions, museums, archives, and libraries uh, with respect to images of works in their collections. Long considered an industry standard, this practice of claiming copyright and charging fees for reproduction and licensing of works held by the institution uh, has served as both a source of revenue for mainly nonprofit and public entities and as a mechanism for maintaining control over the images of the works in their collections. The institution is not claiming copyright on the item itself, but rather on the reproduction of that item. Prior to the advent of digital technology, production of reproductions was a much more labor intensive and cost uh, intensive process with higher staffing and physical uh, material needs. And so it really fomented a climate in which the practice was deemed integral and necessary for an organi organization's subsistence. So commercial licensing of artistic works is ubiquitous in the commercial museum setting that's dominated by uh, an economically driven gift shop culture. We're all familiar with the water lily dorm room posters, the Degas and the mug, and apparently I found a Nicolas Cage Mona Lisa iPhone case. But for most cultural heritage institutions, licensing of images is much more heavily entrenched in the arena of research and scholarly publications. Many institutions offer differential pricing, giving substantial discounts or charging only nominal fees for image requests from nonprofit or scholarly purposes. Uh, in one survey I um, consulted from 2004, 20 art museums were asked about their pricing policy models and reported that Though licensing was a source of revenue for the institutions, the main reasons they were offering image services was related to serving the public and educational uses. So while many cultural heritage institutions do provide image services in-house, including management of permissions and rights, rights and reproductions, uh, there's been an emergence of a third-party licensor vendor market um, that's much more profit mo motivated and has really inserted a different energy into this traditionally service-minded model. Um, the same study I referenced before found that a fee-based model, which was often touted as an economic necessity, um, was actually the amount of revenue uh, raised appeared to be a relevant, uh, a relevant indicator to potential profitability. None of the museums that were interviewed claimed to make any significant surplus or profits against their expenditures. And I'm sure we all know that traversing through the web of copyright rules can be an arduous, time-intensive process, especially for smaller institutions. Um, in a 2012 article from Art Library's journal, author William J. Mayer cites specific dif difficulties faced by archivists who are often tasked with processing unpublished material in myriad formats, uh, requiring them to mediate through arcane copyright provisions to ensure maximum access to their materials. Uh, for many museums and archives, much of their collection contents were produced before 1923, which is the cutoff for automatic assignment of copyright protection. So the obvious question that emerges then is how are institutions claiming copyright on these images of works that are technically in the public domain? This very question came before Judge Lewis Kaplan of the United States District Court of the Southern District of New York in 1999 in the case Bridgman Art Library versus Corral Corp. Uh, in this ca case, the court ruled that photographs of works of art that lie in the public domain despite requiring talent and effort to create are not themselves sufficiently original to merit copyright protection. The plaintiff in the case was UK headquartered image licensor Bridgman Art Library and they sued Corel Corp, a Canadian publishing company, for producing and selling CD-ROM sets containing digital transparencies of public domain images held and licensed by Bridgman. In both his initial ruling and on appeal, uh, Judge Kaplan dismissed the suit's meritoriousness, citing the transparency's lack of originality. And he referenced the plaintiff's own assertion and testimony that, quote, the goal of the transparencies is to be as true to the original work as possible. So in order to claim copyright protection, Bridgman needed to show that the images were, not, were actually authored works and not slavish copies. And so slavish copies is a term to refer to two-dimensional um, works of art that are meant to be exact replications of the original. In his ruling, Judge Kaplan expressed three criteria for determining the originality of a photograph. First, the originality of rendition or production of the physical image, which would include choice of lighting, exposure, uh, filters, developing techniques. Second would be the original, originality of timing, which is the choice of moment. And then finally, the originality of composition, 
uh, choice of staging, subject, and arrangement of scene. Um, while the originality standard did not require novelty, the need for creativity had been assigned to the, by the courts in Feist and was a shift from policy requiring independent authorship and creation. Uh, in a 2006 article in the Texas Intellectual Property Law Journal by C. Cameron, the author explained that in Feist, the court ruled that facts were discovered, not created. That's a really important distinction. Uh, thus, they should remain free for others to copy. So in Bridgman, the images that were uh, the company was claiming rights to were not original artistic creations. They were reproductions of facts or information that exist in the public domain. Judge Kaplan likened the photographic reproductions of Bridgman to that of a photocopier, affirming in an earlier court opinion that neither a change in medium nor any amount of skill, labor, and judgment in execution of a copy warrant determination of originality. So in spite of this very logical ruling, uh, the ruling has really gone largely unnoticed by a lot of museums and cultural heritage institutions, partially because it was um, in a New York district state court, so technically is not the law of the land. However, most attorneys that you talk to say that it's a very sound ruling and people should be paying attention to it. Uh, yet, Bridgman Art Library still claims copyright on their large library of public domain image reproductions, maybe just because they're in the UK and feel like this law doesn't apply to them. Um, and many museums, whether or not fee schedules are employed, um, embed restrictive terms into their permissions and, and use contractual licensing agreements. And these must be executed in order for users to obtain high quality reproductions. Uh, this trend was noted by copyright, uh, Harvard copyright attorney Kyle Courtney, who is part of the um, team that Annie had just mentioned. Uh, and he explained to me in an interview earlier this year that these complicated licensing contracts can establish whatever stipulations they deem appropriate, and they're often irrelevant of IP standards. Uh, some institutions have made noticeable adjustments to their licensing language in the wake of Brook Bridgman, and they often post uh, default licensing agreements on their websites which claim that the scholarly and aesthetic views of the institutions are portrayed in the digital reproductions that they are licensing. So such agreements could be viewed as a loophole or an example of good legal advice, depending on what perspective you're at. Um, but either way, they're really impacting the industry. In a 2001 article uh, by Mitchell Tuckman in the Columbia VLA Journal of Law and Arts, the author surmises that persistent claims of copyright protection by museums are tantamount to, quote, the posting of a sign that says, beware of the dog, when the property owner knows that what lurks behind the fence is an affectionate four pound Pomeranian. That might be a one pound Pomeranian. <laughs> Basically implying that due to their unenforceability, these copyright assertions are intended merely as scare tactics, and they're aimed at promoting proper reproduction practices and just trying to recoup costs wherever possible. Yet those in the scholarly and publishing world perceive such statements as weighted with substantial gravitas. Art historian and scholar Susan Bilstein bemoaning the decline of art book publishing due to exorbitant image, image licensing fees uh, wrote in 2006, quote, there is more here involved than just the pocketbook. What does it mean in a larger sense to claim one can copyright a copy? What does it do to the quality of cultural discourse? If the copyright of a work in the public domain has lapsed, why should reproductions of that work qualify for protection, end quote. This concern over hindrance to creativity resonated in the statements of Jason Mazzone, then professor of Brooklyn Law School, at a 2008 public panel discussion entitled, Who Owns This Image? Art, Access, and the Public Domain After Bridgman versus Perel. Um, Mazzone hypo hypothesized, how much impact did Bridgman really have? Well, if I'm a scholar, I'm just going to obtain a license, even if I think Judge Kaplan was right, because the risk of litigation is just too high, and my publisher will not let me rely on Bridgman. In a 2012 interview, Professor Christopher Sprigman of the University of Virginia uh, Law School stated unequivocally, unequivocally, the Bridgman decision is correct. The US copyright law says that to be copyrighted, a work must be original. If you just take a photo of a public domain painting that has no additional element to it, it's not an original. It's just a reproduction, and you don't get copyright in a public domain work simply by reproducing it. And he went on further to say, in fact, if Congress tried to grant copyright to a flat, slavish reproduction, it would be a violation of the Constitution. The Constitution says clearly that copyright can only be given to authors, not people who merely make reproductions. So the claim of copyright on public domain reproductions is on one hand entrenched in the perceived reliance on income earned from licensing, 
which for private image licensors such as Bridgman is their primary source of income. Yet the claim is also rooted in an ingrained attachment to control and authority, I would assert, uh, historically fostered by cultural heritage institutions in the West and embedded into the contractual agreements enlisted by these institutions, which often forbid cropping and other manipulations um, in an effort to protect against what they consider misuse or misrepresentations of the images in their possession. Kenneth Hama, former executive director of the digital policy at uh, digital policy at the J. Paul Getty Institute Trust, uh, warned of scholarly repercussions of this practice in a 2005 article for DLib magazine, where he stated, "Quote: While examples of museums chasing down digital image miscreants are rare to non-existent, the expectations that museums might do so has had a stultifying effect on the development of digital libraries for teaching and research." This is a really big statement. To what extent should cultural heritage institutions be allowed to control public domain materials? Cameron astutely observed, while ostensibly acting on behalf of the public to safeguard, safeguard cultural heritage, art libraries and museums misuse copyright to restrict access to works that should be available to all. So basically, by changing the nature um, of stewardship from when and where the public can view collections to what and how they can access works in the public domain, such policies and institutions actively stifle the creation of new works and research rather than fostering a policy that promotes new developments in scholarship and art. The advent of digitization has inspired this reactionary response from some institutions that are firmly footed in an outdated stewardship model. Uh, but it may ultimately deem it moot as the open access movement continues to permeate all self sectors of culture and society. In a 2011 Andrew W. Mellon study, the rights and reproduction policies of 11 museums were uh, examined and the adjustments to the same as the institutions adopted a more liberal open access policy and approaches to their collection. Um, the study found that while the impetus for many organizations embracing open access originated in grant stipulations requiring the same, uh, the shifts in policy were generally viewed as mission driven and are now heralded as pinnacle to the institution's strategic planning and public service. While the approach and parameters adopted by in each institution varied, common themes emerged, uh, including um, the necessity of leadership of a visionary tech-savvy director, support of senior management, uh, desire to enrich scholarship and promote the museum's collections, and the necessity of an integrated digital management system and clean metadata. Uh, interestingly, while loss of control was cited by many organizations as a concern at the outset, all surveyed institutions reported that these worries dissipated over time. Uh, in fact, quoting one participant representative, William Noel, Walters Art Museum's former curator of manuscripts, he said, we have lost almost all control and this has been vital to our success. I think this statement reflects a burgeoning belief in the cultural heritage community that by pro providing access to high quality reproductions, institutions are in effect able to reframe the pervasive digital landscape that has allowed for the ubiquity of low quality images. Now while it was predicted that the elimination of licensing fees even for scholarly publications would result in catastrophic revenue loss for cultural heritage institutions, uh, most subsequent studies have nullified this claim. In, a 2011, uh, in 2011, the Victorian Albert Museum reported that while revenues from licensing dropped 25% annually after the decision to not charge for scholarly publications was enacted, changes in statutory funding and high overhead negated any profit margin, noting that aligning revenues with costs is always essential. A 2014 exploration into new Creative Commons licenses used by cultural heritage institutions reported early evidence showed no indication of loss of revenue. And while the impact of revenue loss may be felt more acutely at smaller institutions, especially archives and libraries uh, that do not benefit from the lucrative commercial merchandising income stream, uh, Hammer wrote that there was a lack of substantial data delineating a breakdown in revenue of such profits. Um, Hammer suggested that instead, perceived reliance on licensing income may have led institutions to ignore other funding avenues. And he posits a larger philosophical question. If the hope for commercial licensing revenue diminishes easy access to quality images for education and research, we might be tempted to ask how much income justifies the diminution of the institution's mission-driven goals. In my interview with Kyle Courtney, however, he described himself as falling somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. He did not want to discount the various resources and needs of smaller institutions more reliant on every penny. 
These are issues faced by our own local institutions. And in my interviews with rights and reproduction staff at two local archives, I found recurrent themes in the philosophies behind um, their, ch changing land, their changing licensing policies. Uh, so first I spoke with some folks at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and this is obviously a smaller organization in which economics and sustainability are paramount, as they're not governmentally funded or part of a larger institution. And the two staff people I interviewed uh, resonated this awareness that the landscape was changing, and they hypothesized how institutions would adapt. Currently, the MHS does license use of their digital reproductions, although they do not claim copyright on the images. Um, and their fees range from $25 to $450 an image, varying for nonprofit versus commercial print run format and use. Um, but they have seen their revenues drop year by year uh, from 39,000 in fiscal year 2012, 25, five in 2013, and 22,000 in 2014. Uh, both individuals with whom I spoke feel the institution is slowly moving towards the elimination of fees, but cited the economic realities of small independent institutions. Um, but in addition, they were very concerned that the costs incurred of these fees were mostly falling on the heads of scholars and researchers and the people that were using their collections most, and that they saw a trend where publishers now make the researchers pay for these image fees rather than paying for it them, uh, having the publishers pay for them. So they really had a desire to make uh, use less restrictive. And while they have a, a very strong desire for attribution, they did not desire to exert control over the use of the images. So in contrast, the Schlesinger Library, which is a part of the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University, so embedded in a very large, well-funded organization, um, their rights and reproduction uh, adjustment policy, or adjustments to their policies has uh, changed a little more organically. Um, the University Archives at Harvard and Houghton Library, both in the past several years, have eliminated licensing fees. So the um, reference librarian in charge of rights and reproductions at the Schlesinger started to give internal push to her administration to do the same. Um, the Schlesinger had a very flexible, somewhat arbitrary fee schedule, and revenues from that service were never very high. Um, in addition, the library had already begun adding public domain images to Flickr Commons, and um, the representative with whom I spoke generally expressed confusion over the practice of granting permission to images that were not something they held copyright to. Um, and she said that it didn't really even take an internal analysis to acknowledge that the work required in explaining and mediating copyright questions and licensing requests was overwhelming the department, and really for minimal return. Like many cultural heritage institutions, the Schlesinger uh, desires attribution of their materials, but they have no interest in policing use. So cultural heritage institutions cannot afford to ignore the socio-technological tide ushering in open access. Even as more materials are digitized and made available online, many institutions still assert copyright claim over reproductions of public domain images, or continue to license their use with complicated policies and procedures that prevent, potentially provide minimal return. While creator and institutional rights must be protected, I think it's valuable to remember that in the US, copyright is intended to promote economic and social betterment. And this was a sentiment that was reaffirmed in the 1975 Supreme Court case, 20th Century Music Court versus Aiken. So I want to quote, close with a quote from that case's ruling. Creative work is to be encouraged and rewarded, but private motivation must ultimately serve the cause of promoting broad public availability of literature, music, and the other arts. The immediate effect of our copyright law is to secure a fair return for an author's creative labor. But the ultimate aim is by this incentive to stimulate artistic creativity for the general public good. Thank you very much. I have a bunch of references if anyone wants to see this. Much more. 
more familiar with and less afraid of. And I really love your presentation. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I guess since you've kind of made the distinction between the academic library and the cultural heritage institutions, how do you think these issues apply to public libraries that are other, <laughs> other things other than the, the digital that you have? Well, I mean, in a public library setting, uh, most of the materials are going to be copyright protected already, so you're not dealing with as many public domain related issues. Um, but use, um, is certainly still an issue, and there's certainly, um, you know, I, I didn't even go into like the current state of case law regarding e reserves or that kind of level of copyright, which is kind of, I think, what more um, public libraries are looking at. I don't know if everyone's been following the GSU versus um, Cambridge Press case, uh, where Cambridge Press has been suing um, GSU for use. I'm sure you probably know about it. Um, so I think that there's, there's probably a lot of overlap. Um, in terms of how we can approach these issues when we see them on a case by case basis, but I think some of the some of the angles of where the angles of the, the issue that we're being dealt with are slightly different. So, yeah. And I think especially when when you're thinking about the public or public libraries, I think it often comes down to people are afraid, right? They think they're gonna get sued, so they don't want to do something. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think if we can help people understand the purpose of a copyright law or um, how to put something on Flickr and use Creative Commons, right? Do a session on this is what Creative Commons means and this is how you can use um, Flickr to assign whatever type of Creative Commons you want to assign or you can use all these photos. Um, it's a lot about education and taking away the fear. You know, I think, at least at Simmons, College Council is extremely conservative, extremely conservative, in terms of the licensing things that I can do and what they are willing to take a risk on. It's extremely low. I had this on one of my slides, although I didn't really mention it, um, but the Schlesinger deals with what a lot of archives deal with is that a good portion of their materials are orphan works. Um, and Kyle Courtney, and again, the folks at Harvard are really good folks. Just that could be another whole presentation about how you approach orphan works. And we're, it's very hopeful that there's gonna be some legislation in the next couple years that's gonna address the Copyright Office is going to submit a new proposal again for like the third time it hasn't gotten approved. Um, but, you know, there is this fear, like you said, especially from an administrative side, that they'd rather be overly cautious than run the risk of getting sued. And with a lot of orphan works, you know, the potential of getting sued is so minimal that Kyle Courtney and a lot of the Harvard folks really feel like there's a kind of a series of steps that people working in these institutions can take to kind of, you know, buoy their protection. I mean, is it 100%? No. But it's definitely um, making, it, making yourself feel a little more secure. Um, but there are instances, I think it's less in the, in the archives and library worlds and more in the museum, but the, one of the authors that I referenced, Susan Bielstein, um, who wrote a really good book about this kind of image for the art book publishing world, tells a couple of really scary anecdotal tales where she and Harvard University Press that were her publisher made some arbitrary decision that a 17th century art print that she wanted to use to support her claim in her book was certainly in the public domain. And I'm not sure if it was Bridgman, but a, a huge museum in Europe basically sent them a cease and desist and threatened litigation. And in the end, they were talking about a couple hundred dollars was the amount that they actually technically were claiming they owed them. But I mean, that kind of you know heavyweight with a, a huge museum or a huge organization that has a full-time legal you know legal team for a lowly scholarly you know scholar or, or researcher. I mean, that's enough, at, or for a publisher to probably make them change some of their decisions. One of her things that she said a lot that's a problem is that researchers, and I would imagine this happens outside of the art world, is that researchers will choose to use different images that maybe don't support their research quite as well because they're cheaper or they're available. And so often it is impacting research. I mean, I think the other thing that's really important here, and when I talked about program development, I mean, and that means for rights management as well. Just having a slate out policy and program of, you know, we do these things to ensure license, you know, um, that we're 
in step with the license or if it's an orphan work, we post things at these specific places asking if people know things about it. We do that three times. Like all of those things are a part of doing your di due diligence and limiting your liability. So did anyone else, was anyone else at any Kyle, um, Kyle Courtney's NEA presentation? So I thought he, he and um, his colleague have come up, that was the first time they presented their new legal theories that they want to push into the world for how to deal with orphan works. And a lot of them pull from other aspects of intellectual property law. So rules about trademark or things where, like you were saying, if you post for a period of time that you know you should then be allowed to um, you know, say that copyright had, rights have been given up or perhaps setting up some sort of fund where you know, orphan works have money that's put into them and so if someone comes forward to claim that, that there is some sort of um, you know, return for them. Um, so I think that we'll probably, hopefully, see some good developments. It, it, fair use is another really strange, I mean, the, the, the accompanying documentation of the law regarding fair use in the US basically says that it's really vague. Like they admit that it's too vague to really be very enforceable and that we should be careful. Yeah, so it's, I mean, there's five things, yeah. and you're like, what? And it's all variable, you know? So it's like, for each five, you know, five aspects, it's like the spectrum on each one. And you're like, who decides this? I decide something totally different than you would. Um, but I think with the advent of MOOCs, especially in academia, um, you know, fair use is gonna be a big thing. of being updated. It, yes, it's in the process of being updated. Dot, 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 we have no idea. I mean, that's part of that conference, was if you have mm -hmm. policies in place, mm -hmm. that will strengthen any fair yes. use thing that you'll yes. get in court. If you can produce a policy and say, we're following right. our policy, then people have less mm -hmm. legal, you know, that might keep the legal mm -hmm. department here at Simmons or any other right. institution off your back a little I if think you have a policy. I think the other thing that you have to think about in terms of um, the ecosystem of the college or a small liberal arts college as a whole, college council has what, like 2.5 FTE, you know, they have staff, like two or three of them, right? And their primary focus on is on making sure that the college doesn't get sued. It's not on copyright, you know? So they, we all, I, I think we also have to be fair about what their priorities are and what we can expect from them. Now, I mean, we're in the library world and we're saying, yes, this is really important, why aren't you paying attention to us? Um, but we have no idea what they're dealing with. And their expertise is probably not in the areas of copyright and fair use. Um, so I had a question for these cultural areas. Related thing, um, I talked to Kyle Courtney about this for quite a while because I and and in my in my recorded interview with the MHS folks, they basically said the same thing. They're like, we realize we're treading, like our our policy treads a really fine line. We're saying, okay, we don't own copyright on these, but we're licensing the use of them as if we did. Mm -hmm. And really, it's more it comes down to the fact that if you if the user agrees to it. It's a contract, and it really doesn't matter what it says. Um, you know, a contract can have really crazy stipulations in it that might be counter to what would be right or what would exist if the contract didn't exist. But if the two parties agree to it, then that's the, that's what rules, basically. Um, I mean, I guess you could say as a user, you could try to call it into question. You could say, I don't want to agree to this, so I want to use it anyhow. Um, I think that the the experience of the MHS shows that. The, the folks that are doing this recognize that this is kind of an untenable situation. 
and that it makes them feel a little uncomfortable. Like they, one of the things that, you know, the woman at the Schlesinger that I spoke with said is that she just felt like this wasn't the business that they should be in. You know, this licensing of images, it felt like the wrong business for their mission. Um, and I think that, you know, the MHS expressed that they're much more beholden to a board, uh, a board that's outside of academia who doesn't understand why they would be giving anything away for free. And so they have to kind of slowly show proof and justification why they want to move in this way. But they've been putting forth proposals that are moving towards reducing fees, relaxing fees, and they really think that, you know, as the cultural tide turns, that the institutional will, will come along with that and eliminate fees eventually. Does that answer your question?